Well, let me uh, start by uh, also thanking the organizers because I think it's been a wonderful uh, uh, day and a half already, and I'm. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last uh, last days, and uh, I, I know how much time it takes to organize something like this. And uh, I, I do uh, want to thank you sincerely for putting this together because it's been wonderful, and I, I'm sure that everybody agrees with me on that. Um, what I'll talk about uh, today is uh, work very much in progress on uh, a question whether or not there are ideological differences in threat sensitivity. And this is joint work with my colleague Gijs Schumacher from the University of Amsterdam and uh, Finn Arsenal from Temple University. And um, I'm also uh, at the University of Amsterdam in the ethics board. And I, I have to inform people when I do some of my studies that there might be uh, visuals that uh, could make you somewhat upset. Um, that could be also part of this presentation. So uh, I, I have now collectively informed you. And, and uh, for now, assume that's enough. Um, um, whether or not that matters, your responses to these images matters for ideology is a different question, uh, which I'll come to talk about. But um, I want to give you a little bit of a, um, of a background, because both in psychology and political science, there is a literature developing uh, dating back to work by Adorno, the Frankfurt School, trying to understand whether or not somebody's psychological dispositions are associated with your ideological preferences. And this has been widely studied in, uh, in these both fields, gets, also gets coverage uh, from uh, like here, Business Insider, which traits correlate with ideology. Also the election of Donald Trump, which is not ideology but voting, has sparked interest in whether or not it's the authoritarian personality that has come to rise to power in the United States. Um, and a lot of this work, for those of you who are not familiar with that, uh, essentially uh, is based on surveys. So we ask people about their ideological preferences, which could be like on a scale from left to right, where do you stand? Or uh, what are your positions on immigration, income inequality? And then, so that's the ideological components. And then on the other hand, uh, people uh, ask questions about personality. So uh, for instance, uh, well-known big five traits have been asked in surveys. So to what extent are you open to new ideas? Do you think uh, you would go like to go to a museum? And then we get a scale of the degree of openness. And that then, for instance, correlate uh, negatively with conservatism, so that conservatives seem to score a little high, uh, lower on openness, a bit more close-minded. And uh, But the thing is, this is all sort of often exceptions there. Uh, and I'm also guilty of this myself. Uh, this is cross-sectional research uh, on, on, on various populations. And so uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, which is 2008, uh, John Hibbing, uh, Kevin Smith, and a paper by, uh, headed by Doug, Douglas Oxley uh, published a paper which was published in Science. And it had a, it had a particular something really interesting to it because we, they could move away from the self-reports. They could use physiological traits and see, show that these physiological traits in response to threatening images actually correlated with your ideological positions. And um, what I'm going to talk today about sort of my experiences with pre-registration have not, so the starting point has not been I read this paper, became skeptical and started doing uh, uh, replication studies. I actually read this and been been on board on this, like, like, hey, this actually really makes a lot of sense. So, um, but at some point, I had the opportunity to test some of this and 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 started to have difficulties replicating this, and that is how I got into a replication project. Um, but to maybe tell you a little bit about what this, they actually do in this study, um, it, I'm just going to talk over the study a little bit. So uh, John and Kevin have in Nebraska have a lab. This is not their lab, but uh, this is a classical social psych lab uh, with. Um, with a bioamplifier in it. And so what we're measuring is uh, arousal. So skin, uh, various ways of measuring that, but one of them is skin conductance. So the idea is if you get more aroused, your sweat glands open. And we put two electrodes on your fingertips. And we know there's a little bit of electrical current going through these electrodes. And we know from electricity that it conducts better if you have more <laughs> fluid. So more sweat secretion from the glands. You get a higher conductance. So the skin conductance goes up we see that as a sign that people are more aroused. So how do we get that arousal? And how do we get these differences in arousal to get at threat sensitivity? Well, people sit in a room, in a lab, in a cubicle, blank screen, black screen, and then suddenly there's an image flashed on the screen like this. And, um, and this image is shown for 10 seconds so that we get 
the skin conductor takes a little bit of time before it, uh, before it responds. The sweat glands have to open, the fluid has to, go, to come out. Uh, then you go again to a black screen so you can actually take a rest a little bit and then there might be something like this. Um, this is varied with uh, bunnies and uh, uh, other things that uh, neutral images, it's not just all threat. Um, and then essentially what you can do is you can calculate uh, the mean change uh, in response to each of these images compared to the baseline and create an index of threat sensitivity. So the extent to which you are aroused uh, can be expressed as, an, as an, sort of an individual difference. And uh, in the science paper, that has been then correlated with um, political ideology, meaning that people who are socially conservative, so who uh, answer, um, they tend to be opposed to abortion, immigration, uh, gay rights, they seem to score a little higher on this threat sensitivity. Index. This is correlational research, so uh, I'm not even talking about the causal arrow here, but this is interesting. 2008 got a lot of attention, uh, The Daily Show. It's been in, in, in all sorts of, uh, of newspapers, and it's, it's been a part of also a reassurance for the people doing self-reports, like, hey, well, if we can also do this with these physiological measures, well, you know, there, there must be really something to this. And so in 2014, for instance, there's a huge discussion in behavior brain sciences uh, with a target ar article by Smith and Hibbing on this, they now don't call it threat sensitivity, but negativity bias, but it's the same. Uh, and there's like over 20 people in the field who are key researchers in this field discussing the theoretical relevance and the scope conditions of this. But what we don't see is actual uh, attempts to replicate this. And um, Hibbing and Smith actually, to some extent, acknowledge this, and they, they write at some point, like, whether or not this replicates this, but, well, we don't know this until other laboratories weigh in. And, and this is where uh, we come in. Uh, this is me and this is Finn Arsenault. Uh, we both uh, have uh, labs in, uh, in, in two countries, uh, the United States and in the Netherlands, and last year, as part of a Marie Curie Fellowship, uh, I visited Finn in Philadelphia to work with him, so that's how we started to collaborate on some of these issues, because um, what we realized is that we both had, um, in the Netherlands and in the United States, had included sometimes these threatening images in our studies. Why did, we, why did I, in the Netherlands, include these images? Because I was interested in physiological response to political communication. But I thought, I need to have something of a baseline of like, what does it mean if people respond to a political message, if we get a skin conductor's increase, maybe I can compare that to the responses to a snake. Whether or not that's meaningful, I leave you to, to judge that, but that was my idea. But I, uh, being in Philadelphia, I, I realized like, hey, we can actually try to replicate uh, um, the association between threat sensitivity and uh, political ideology in a sample in the Netherlands, which was like 80, 90 uh, students in my, uh, in my lab. And then uh, Finn in Philadelphia over the course of years had also included these images and had asked people about their ideology. So we had like 350 people of the greater Philadelphia area. And so went to the, to the science paper and um, tried to replicate created indices of threat sensitivity uh, and uh, say, see to what extent that correlated with ideological dimensions that we had. I call these conceptual replications because it were not the same images. The ideological, uh, the way we measured ideology varied a little bit also between the studies. But the main thing is, like, it didn't really matter how I sliced the data. I could not find any correlation between threat sensitivity and ideology. It didn't matter if I would take a specific image, an index, a specific ideological item. I could look at the extent to which is the high or the low sophisticated. For those of you who are in this literature, they might say, well, this kind of would make all sense. So we're like, well, maybe we need to really do something with this. And, um, and so that's study three, which I'll talk uh, in a bit more detail about, is, and, and the importance of that, is that we said, well, let's, let's then go back to the science paper and do a, do a pre-registered replication. So uh, we asked in the pre-analysis plan, we essentially asked three questions. The first is, well, is there actually something of a physiological trait? That's the first assumption. Do people that respond to a snake also respond to, uh, with increase in arousal to a gun or a, uh, a knife? The second then would be the expectation, as following from the science paper, is that an increase in threat sensitivity would be positively associated with social conservative positions. Because in the science paper there's a bit of a nuance whether or not it would then not correlate with economic policy positions. And then uh, the third step is what we did in the pre-analysis plan is, is specify a whole bunch of robustness uh, checks. 
So to what extent there's people in political science arguing that only the, those with very sophisticated, that know a lot about politics, they can pair their psychological traits with their ideological positions. You could think, this is Philadelphia, Philadelphia is diverse. You could think that in, uh, this might only uh, happen among people who are ethnically white, because that's, that was the Nebraska sample, more or less. You could think of um, uh, uh, a variety of robust checks, which I might come to talk about. But then, well, what did we do in the methods? Well, we asked, we reached out to uh, to, to Smith and Hibbing, and uh, they they very kindly shared their, that what they had of the study with us. So, including the original stimulus material, which was uh, a spider on the face of a person, uh, maggots in a wound, and a dazed individual. Um, I leave you to your own uh, evaluation whether or not this is all threat or uh, whether or not the maggots might also be to some extent disgusting. Uh, that, that would at least be somewhat of my interpretation. But we had these original three items. We had the uh, attitude questions that they used. In the original science paper, there were 15 questions about social conservative policies. Um, am I still? No. <laughs> so tempting. Um, there were 15, but there were three items that were essentially not um, that were that that were not relevant. It was one about the war in Iraq. There was one about uh, uh, essentially about war and and things that were really time sensitive to 2006. Um, so we excluded these, but we, don't, we can we assume that this is social conservatism dimension is pretty much what we would expect it to be. So in the pre-analysis plan, what did we do? Well, we, we looked at the power. The original study had 48 people from Nebraska. We said, well, if we want to achieve that same power, we probably want to have 200 people. We specified as detailed as we could the procedures, but physiological data, I've so much come to like Likert scales because they're really not that much I can do to them. But physiological data is 1,000 observations per second. You really have a lot of choices to make. So we tried to be as explicit as possible, wrote some equations of how we would operationalize threat sensitivity. This is the way the science paper did it. So the mean, logged mean over the, uh, the, the, the exposure period subtracted from the log mean during the uh, pre-treatment uh, period. We specified the covariates. We specified our modeling strategy. Um, so the test of our hypotheses, what covariates to include, what to do with missing values, and what to do, which people we excluded and for what reasons. So for instance, if skin conducted, some people don't respond for, on skin conducted uh, measures. So uh, we had some, some criteria how to exclude these. So the first question, is there a physiological trait? So just a simple correlation matrix to, with the, the change in skin conductance to each of these individual images. Uh, dark red, the darker red is the more positive. Um, there's really nothing going on. If anything, uh, the physiological response to the maggots is negatively correlated with the wounded man. Uh, those of you, but people do respond to that, so they pass a manipulation check, but it just don't seem to correlate with a trait. So we specified in the pre-analysis plan that we would still go continue with the latent trait, but that we would also analyze uh, uh, image by image. And so what I'll show you is then the question, well, do these uh, uh, political attitudes vary with physiological traits? Um, and I'll show you uh, two uh, coefficients of regression models, one for social conservatism, so these were closest to the Hibbing and uh, Smith paper, and then economic conservatism. And as you can see, the, uh, the index of the three images does not correlate, or is not a, so this is the uh, standardized regression coefficient, it's just essentially zero. Um, then the three specific images, so a response to the spider, we should actually see positively signed coefficients because like more threat sensitivity, more conservatism. Um, but we actually, the coefficients are negative, but like not close to uh, if you care about p-values uh, uh, to, to conventional standards. Response to the maggots, maybe a little, like there's a positive sign, but then the re response to the wounded man is again circling around zero. So essentially what we, we seem to, we really have a hard time if we fail to replicate this in, in, uh, with this study. We then said, well, we also pre-registered a whole bunch of extensions. Um, and I'll just say we have a bunch of different ideological dimensions which would also be related to social conservatism. We find no associations. We had, so that's these indices, we had in total six threatening images because we included three more that have been used in other studies on threat sensitivity and other outcomes. And also these other three images don't correlate whatsoever with uh, threat sensitivity. So I'm going to skip two slides just uh, to, um, for, the, for the sake of the time. 
robustness checks, because this, some people warned me when I showed them the pre-analysis plan and said, you, you specified too many checks, but really, nothing, there's really no way we, which we slice the data that we get to the, uh, to the uh, association. So the sophisticated, for the sophi politically sophisticated, no correlation between threat sensitivity and ideology. Uh, is it conditional on the item, so that the, the way we measure ideology, per item there's no consistent pattern of association. It's conditional upon race or any other characteristic, not really. So um, these three studies have a hard time uh, uh, replicating the uh, original science paper. And uh, I'm going to use the last minute to say a little bit of why I think, especially in this field of sort of physiology and politics, or physiology broadly, this is, it's relevant to do pre-registration. Because this is costly research. It's one participant at a time per hour. So you need, for 200 people, 200 hours in the lab. If you want a lab assistant, you need a lab. You need the equipment, so the investment costs are high. Then if you get the data, you have huge amounts of, 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 of analytical choices to make. And uh, then if we look for the literature for suggestions, there seems to be an enormous amount of between lab differences. So it's really hard to say, well, what, how do you then, what's the gold standard to specify this? And, uh, and therefore, uh, this is how Vin and I talk about this at least, is like we see the pre-analysis plan as at least well, when we started this study, these were our best thoughts of how we can do this. And then we analyzed them in that way, because we're not only doing replication projects for, with this, with work, but also try to test different theories. Obviously, we can do exploratory work, but we at least have a good distinction between that what we thought we were going to do, and that what we then essentially afterwards did, which might have showed some results. Uh, aside from that, I'm trying to work on a uh, on a multiple labs uh, project where we would then have very many more labs because 200 people is a lot in this literature, but it's still small. So uh, thank you for your attention and uh, um, look forward to questions. Thanks, Barrett. We have about eight minutes for questions. Did you have any contact or reactions from the original authors? Uh, yeah, well, we, um, when we uh, presented the, uh, the first two studies at a conference, so before we started doing the, the pre-registration, um, they, um, they, they were there. They've, they've been very accommodating. They, they, we've, we're in good contact with them. Um, uh, we, we gave the opportunity also to look at the pre-analysis plan. We did not get much substantive feedback there at that point, but um, one of the things that, that, we've, that we talked about is especially uh, the failure also to replicate this in a Dutch, small convenience Dutch sample was a bit of a uh, disappointment, I'd say, for some of the original offers because it, who knows, it might have been some sort of US only thing, which would not, which would run against the theory, which has assumed that it's sort of something of a, um, of a, um, Universal, a universal, uh, a universal trait that then would, in all contexts, would relate to ideology, which is, for some of the political psychology people that work on personality and politics, uh, they would probably uh, disagree with that that statement to begin with. But we are so uh, we are now writing up this paper, and we're gonna send the, the the before we send it out, we're gonna send it to to the original authors as well again to give them the opportunity to respond. But um, yeah, we followed as closely as we could the original procedure. So there I don't see much um, uh, um, that we could have done differently. But I, I, we've both, Finn and I have both been, I've never been so nervous to present at a conference when I first presented that because, but I, I really don't, I, somebody earlier mentioned it, like sort of this idea of gotcha, and I don't, this is really not how we went after us. We didn't look for science, what paper can we replicate? Well, we were, we, and we are right now more thinking about how should this system one response of threat sensitivity, what would be the theoretical reason for it to be related to ideology, or could there be conditions? And so we're trying to do some follow-up work there as well. I actually have a question. Did you have like 48 participants from Nebraska? <laughs> no, we didn't. We had 200 people from a greater Philadelphia area. So um, that could be a... Uh, so, so we recruited among students, but also what really worked well was Craigslist ads, um, which the graduate student who was running most of the participants was a bit hesitant to begin with to get people from Craigslist, but that actually gave quite some ideological, uh, some, some interesting variance in people.
Uh, also, one quick question, because you yeah. just also used the word uh, personality, yeah. because you do not really measure personality. Well, we have we have in some of the work in uh, in in some of the earlier uh, data that we had in in Philadelphia, we have measures of the Big Five, and there you get you get the correlation. So positive a negative correlation between openness and social conservatism, and positive between conscientiousness and. Yeah. Well, this. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, we don't have, well, yeah, but the first sign of personality would be that there would be some sort of coherence in these responses. And, you know, maybe this would be interesting to get people over time in the lab to see if your response to the spider at two times is relatively high. You kind of assume that. But at least that sort of these images. And also when we have, I, I skipped over that. Um, but this is with six with six total images. Like it's only a response to a spider and a dog, which you would probably that correlate positively with, with each other. You would probably call that animal threat. Um, I guess that's my interpretation of this. Oh wait, There's somebody in the back. Hi, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the study, Beth. It was really interesting to see. Also, uh, well. Um, uh, run, I think. Uh, I have a question um, regarding uh, distinct emotions. You yeah. said yourself that some of the stimuli would uh, maybe actually elicit disgust rather yeah. than uh, fear yeah, 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 or threat. Yeah. Have you thought about this? I did, you didn't show the other six threatening yeah. images. Did you test for well, what so emotions they actually elicit? That's a great question. Uh, I always, uh, as you all would recognize, we, I would have asked people now afterwards how they felt about this, like use some sort of measure of self-reported arousal of discrete emotions. What I didn't talk about is we also had, there's been by the same team also been work on disgust sensitivity and ideology. We also have all the disgusting items that were used in these studies. And these also don't correlate whatsoever with, uh, with, with ideology, with the original stimuli. So um, that said, we are thinking about running a follow-up uh, where we are asking people also how they feel about it. So perhaps what you feel toward what you report, because maybe these, this system one response is relating that to a system two outcomes, like political attitude, that might be a long stretch, just as IAT with, with some sort of behavior. So perhaps that's at least a bit of the line that we're thinking about. So we're actually going to go in the field, slightly different design, where we are going to ask people also uh, 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 their self-reported emotions. I was just wondering. Um if if it makes a difference if you see the image as the first image as the first threat yeah. image so basically because after a while you get yeah. numb and then it doesn't have the effect yeah, it's, a great, it's a great question uh, we pre-registered also to control for order and as you so skin conductance has a bit of a uh, a, a drift in it so the the, the general response of decrease, decreases a little bit but um, uh, we don't see clear order signs like that that um, uh, that that seeing a threat, the sixth threatening image is not different than the first. And it doesn't, we had a total of 30 images, so um, that, that really seems, uh, didn't seem to matter. But so that's the nice thing about the pre-analysis plan is that we also kind of wrote down, say, that's what we're also going to include as a covariate. Yeah. Hey, Bert, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. I was looking forward to it since I'm working a little bit yeah. in the same uh, area. And I was actually curious about the people who do not respond physiologically. Yeah. So how many people are we talking about? And have you maybe tested those compared to the ones who do react? And then it's like a bit an experimental manipulation. Yeah, and do they respond good, differently? It's a good, we, 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 we set out, um, so we, we, we specified an exclusion criteria after responses below a certain value, we would exclude them. Uh, but also if we include these people and control for the fact that they had a lower uh, response, uh, so non-responders essentially, um, that doesn't really matter. Uh, and I, what I did not do yet uh, is um, is check if these people systematically differ. That, that's a that's a good that's a good suggestion. Thanks. We would have time for a final question if there is one. Right. Yes. Yeah. 
Hi, Bert. Hi, really Bob. great presentation. Um, we were talking yesterday, I was wondering, left wondering about the fact that while we're measuring something latent, something mm -hmm. for which we don't have a standard, mm -hmm. which are either emotions or disgust sensitivity, mm -hmm. and what we expect in this sort of measurement is that there are some correlations between those indicators. And what I found in the correlations that you saw is that there isn't. No. So it really bears the question, do you think they are related at all? And how does that play in that line of research? Yeah, it's a great question, Flavio. Uh, I, I, I've, I'm relatively confident in this in the sense that we did, uh, that we did the way we, we did the manipulation check is that we look compared to, for instance, a basket. That's the first image we, we asked always. It's new, relatively neutral. Just a bread basket. The physiological compared to the, the change in physiological response to looking to that basket versus a snake, a dog, there is always more increase to the snake and the dog, which we say, well, at least we we think we've measured this correctly because that would have been that was my first concern a little bit. It's like, well, maybe we screwed up. Uh, we, 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 the manipulation check is, is 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 successful. Then they don't correlate. I I don't know, like Flavio. I think it's too early to say with just this data whether or not there is or isn't something like that. In this data, it isn't. In the original paper, that's not been reported. Uh, I haven't asked for the data of the original uh, paper. Uh, but but um, also in the other two studies we did, we find the same. If the only sort of consistent correlation we find is is essentially what maybe would be called animal threat. So if you're scared of a dog, you're probably also scared of a snake. Uh, and, and that seems to make sense, but how that relates to a knife, uh, also people who study threat might, might, might say, well, that might be actually different components, so maybe it's, uh, I'm at least more doubtful now that it exists than before I started this. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks.